Our next speaker is the sixth child of Fred Phelps, a man who we all know and love. <laughs> and, uh, but he's a bit different than the others. He left home at the age of 18, and after years of study and searching for religion and other sorts of things like that, um, today he's a writer, speaker, and LGBT advocate. He is also the executive director of the Center for Inquir Inquiry in Alberta, Can in Calgary, Alberta. Bob, where's Alberta? It's in Canada, eh? <laughs> so here's our very own atheist, Nate Phelps! Going to, uh, I've been talking to my girlfriend about uh, marketing that name, A Theist. <laughs> Gotta sell well in Canada. So, being invited to speak at a uh, conference with the word sexy in it, like Aaron says, or is it Aaron? Aaron. <laughs> like Aaron says, it was a little unusual for me. I couldn't say anything that's sexy about my story, but. I mean, I get it for someone like Iran. It's not about age, Iran, it's about your hair. <laughs> of course, Daryl is an obvious choice with his uh, recent book and the uh, talk that he gives. And then Greta with her uh, the whole angry atheist thing going on. That's pretty hot. <laughs> and then David, you know, and someone who writes about you know, porn with kilts. It's just sexy. <laughs> but how is my story sexy? What do I have to contribute? Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation. Amen. Now, how hot is that? <laughs> so I think I was seven, six or seven years old, and my father got tired of waiting for the kids to find the passages he was preaching from in the Bible. So he required us to learn the books of the Bible, and afterwards, if someone took too long, he would pause in his sermon, cast a gimlet eye on the offending child, and demand that somebody smack that kid. So that was the environment we grew up in. In 1991, a small church in Topeka, Kansas, burst on the scene like a festering abscess, went after the gays at a local park there. 22 years later, how far have they come? From harassing the community to a national test case of the limits of free speech. From belittling, belittling their neighbors to impinging on the national psyche with their biblical cudgel. Nothing is sacred, no one is immune. Victims large and small are their targets. Natural disasters are their impetus. The Navy Yard shooting, Sandy Hook, the Army school children, the Colorado theater shooting, Matthew Shepard, Hurricane Katrina, Texas a and Virginia Tech, where there's a national, national wound, you'll find the salt of the Westboro Baptist Church. God hates everyone and everything in America because we dare to insist that the constitutional mandate of equality for all be met. When Steve Jobs passed away, they picked at his funeral, said he, he had a uh, national platform preached the word of God and didn't take advantage of it. They made their announcements with their iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was the uh, front page of one of the Ku Klux Klan websites where they put up a disclaimer saying that they had nothing to do with 
and did not support the ideas of the Westboro Baptist Church. So now you've got a group that's more hated even than the Ku Klux Klan. Folks looking at them or meeting them or hearing about them for the first time think it's pretty amazing. They stare and stun amazement. For me, it was inevitable from the experiences I grew up with there. My father's theological message was fed to us from infancy. Literally, the first week, the first Sunday of our lives, we were in church twice. We had verses to memorize put up on the blackboard in our, uh, in our uh, family room. There were books and records teaching the violent stories of the Old Testament. And there was a painted sign that sat in the vestibule of our church. I don't know where it was originally, but it had broken and it was sitting leaning up against the wall in the vestibule of our church most of my childhood. And it had a verse from the book of Hebrews painted on it that said, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. One of my first cogent memories was of me sitting in the, one of the pews. It was actually back in those days. We had gotten some old uh, theater seats, and uh, they weren't even moved to the floor. I was sitting in the, one of the pews, and my father's voice in the background preaching again about hellfire and brimstone, and that uh, the worm that eats on you never dies. So I'm determined to grasp this concept of eternity for the first time, and I start thinking about it. His voice in the background, and suddenly I was just struck by this intense feeling of fear and dread. Started crying. Didn't realize it then, but the walls around my heart were already under construction. My father's a self styled primitive Baptist, largely adhering to the teachings of John Calvin, woven throughout Calvin's theology is this concept of uh, absolute predestination. Absolute predestination posits that in the council halls of eternity past, an all-powerful, all-knowing God preordained who would be saved and who would go to hell. We don't have anything to say about it. It's not our choice because we're all dead in our trespasses and sins. If you're selected, you gain eternal life. You didn't do anything for it. And if you lose, you suffer the most extreme physical and mental anguish forever. Over the years, my father has refined that doctrine to the point that he now concludes that everyone here, everyone in America, everyone on the earth is going to hell, except that small group in Topeka, Kansas. Only he and his followers have been chosen by God in this end time. Furthermore, they believe that none of them will die that death is a judgment from God. So Christ's return, Christ's return is imminent because my father's pushing 85, 83. So something's gotta happen pretty quick or that whole system is gonna start falling apart. <laughs> this doctrine as it's understood and practiced by them is very important to understand West Pro Baptist Church and that message that we grew up with. Salvation is a gift. You have no effect on it. So there's no real way of knowing if you even have it. We heard terms like an impression on the heart or a calling or an unction. These very subjective terms didn't really know whether you had them. You, sometimes you had a feeling you were fairly certain you had it. So it logically follows that my father in the church there is not carrying these signs and preaching to try to change anybody's mind, to try to save anybody. That's not their job. <coughs> That's, that's God's job. It's their job to do the preaching. One of my father's favorite phrases behind the pulpit was, if God don't want you, we don't want you. Either he chooses you or you go to hell. And if he does choose you, somehow you miraculously end up at the Westboro Baptist Church. <coughs> to illustrate this point, he was on a uh, talk show in Southern California back in the mid-90s. Was a popular Christian apologist at the time named Rich Bueller. And Bueller's making the point that the fact that he's been doing this now at that time for 35 years and hadn't built much of a congregation. And my father got angry at him and snapped back and said, That's not the test. The test is fidelity in preaching. And Bueller says, Well, what about that New Testament passage that says you'll know them by their fruit? To which my father uttered that most profound 
debate ending theological imperative that's the cornerstone of their campaign. He said, well, Rich, you're just wrong. We were taught that the only true Bible was the King James Bible. From this Bible, we were taught a variety of doctrines and behaviors that were rigorously upheld. On the few occasions someone within the church challenged his version, my father was viciously decisive in quelling the rebellion with threats of human and defying violence on the person and his eternal soul. <coughs> we learned that every thought and deed in our lives were laced with moral implications. Every decision was a decision for or against the will of God. We were not to be of this world but separate from it. We would look at what the world did and assume it was evil and find the evidence for that in the Bible. If isolation doesn't come naturally, he forced it. So when our teachers led the classroom in Christmas carols, we were required to leave the classroom and go down to the uh, school library. <coughs> Childhood indiscretions took on profound implications that reverberated down the halls of eternity. When we misbehaved, our father would rage for hours that we were sons of Belial, workers of iniquity, pawns of Satan, sinning against the most high God. It's no wonder that we grew up fearful of our mistakes and hiding our shortcomings. The natural process of growth through error was stymied in our earliest years. We learned that our hearts were deceitful and desperately wicked that we were inherently evil and only God's work in our hearts made us marginally acceptable in his eyes. Eyes, I might add, that were remarkably similar to our father's. Our education about the world was profoundly colored by this fundamental message. And one of my earliest doubts about my father's religion rose from this question. If in fact the Adamic race is so thoroughly cursed with this moral corruption, how is it that we so willingly turn to the writings of these same corrupt men to find our salvation? Fred would answer that the Bible says these corrupt men were guided by the Spirit of God when they penned their work. How many of you have seen the documentary uh, Most Hated Family in America? Have any of you seen the second one? We've got a second one coming out called The Most Hated Family in Crisis and Louis Thoreau is talking to uh, Steve Drain, who's one of the leaders of that, that uh, effort there. And Drain calls him, he says, well, you know, Steve, what the Bible says about you. He says, you're a fool because you're an atheist. And Louis says, well, it would, wouldn't it? I thought that was a pretty strong point he made, and that's the point I would make here. That, of course, a, a book that professes to be the word of an all-powerful God would say that the ones who wrote it were being guided by God's hand. It's just another way of saying that that's no answer at all. From behind the pulpit, our father raged against our every belief system and every world leader. Straw men were built up and destroyed Sunday after Sunday as he taught us that since God hated them, we must hate them. That if their ideas contradicted his ideas, then there were satanic ideas. One insidious consequence of this practice was to ingrain in our minds that the very tools of discernment that we were born with are evil. We learned not to trust the process of reasoning as it would raise ideas that contradicted the one truth from God that we were taught by our Father. If something reasonable surfaced in our mind that was contrary to those ideas that we were taught, our instinct was to challenge it fear it, and reject it. For years, this was a profound barrier for me. As I tried to evolve and define the world as I saw it, I continually rejected or minimized fundamentally sound ideas for fear that they were spiritually evil. Just in the past month or so, I had another understanding coalesced in my mind when I realized that before I let go of religion, I always felt like understanding the world was impossible. With all the unprovable ideas that made up my schemas and paradigms, it always felt like there was no way to really grasp life issues and make a logical decision. 
When your mind is full of fanciful ideas that have no basis in fact or evidence, the world remains a frightening mystery. Wrong decisions were too easy to make and the consequences were too great to ignore. But there was another aspect of growing up within the walls of Westboro. Any violation of Fred's rules put you at risk of being beaten or ostracized or both. When I grew up there, we heard about being ostracized. Our father made it clear that if we abandoned the church, that he, we would be cut off. But it really doesn't have a lot of significance to a child because there's no context, there's no way to really understand that. But after you've been kicked out and you're cut off from everything that you know, everything you've lived your entire life, it starts to have the effect of making you wonder what was wrong with you? What did you do that made you um, hated by God? How could an idea in your head cause your family to hate you? It's a wicked tool to maintain control. But perhaps the most control controlling aspect of all that is after years of 18 years of ritualistic teaching, it's hammered into every fiber of your being that God is waiting at the gate to smite those who would stray. So you wander through life wondering why God chose you for this particular fate. And when will he strike and how much will you suffer? I mentioned a moment ago about the risk of being beaten. Violence was a fact of life in our home. As I reached the age of awareness, my father had made the decision that he was going to return to school and get his law degree. He had at that time, I think, ten kids and uh, a wife and he was unable to uh, maintain financial support for him with what work he was doing. So the pressure of going to school and maintaining the financial needs of the family, um, he ended up getting uh, addicted to prescription uh, amphetamines. And then to go to sleep at night, he ended up addicted to the barbiturates as well. So he had this chemical cocktail in his body and the pressure that he was feeling, and, it made him uh, quick, and he had a quick temper, and he was very violent at times. But despite all these circumstances, he eventually got his law degree, started practicing law, but within a couple of years, he had been brought up on charges, and uh, his license was suspended for two years. So he didn't have any income coming in. So he hit on this idea of uh, sending the kids out to sell candy. So we started selling candy in Topeka and the, the rationale behind that was we were buying a new organ for the church. And after a couple of years of that, people started asking us how much that organ cost and why didn't we have it yet. So we moved out into surrounding communities and we're selling candy in Wichita and Kansas City and then we're up in Omaha and down in Oklahoma City. And uh, somewhere in that process, we discovered that when people have a few drinks, they spend more money. So. Friday and Saturday nights would find us um, going through the bars, peddling our wares for Jesus with strippers performing just a few feet away. Now you got to understand I'm not complaining about the view, <laughs> but there was, uh, it was difficult for me to figure out how we could be separated from the world and how we were special, but we were involved in that kind of activity. And then on the first anniversary of his suspension, I remember coming home from school one day and my mother was sitting in the vestibule of the church. My older brother Mark had his arm around her shoulder. She had been crying. She had a hat on her head, a stocking cap, and uh, she pulled it off and said he cut off all my hair. And, and all of her, she had long black hair. And all of it had been cut off and there were places where you could see the scalp. And, uh, the thing that was most frightening to me was uh, that my father had taught us from the time we were, you know, were born that uh, women were to have their hair uh, long as a uh, evidence of their submission to God. And he had defined or decided that the word long was properly translated to uncut. So it wasn't just that he had committed this violent act on my mother, but it was that he was um, 
he had, in my mind, uh, condemned her to hell because he had cut all of her hair off. Women were second-class citizens in our church and family. My father proclaimed this adamantly and with no room for compromise. The Bible was very clear on the subject. Eve had been deceived by a talking snake, so logically she was a weaker vessel in all respects. And see, this is supposed to get a laugh, folks. <laughs> I've never understood that. I mean, I remember I was at a, uh, a talk by a, a, a physicist who was going to explain how he could prove the existence of God. And he was saying how silly it was that uh, people could argue that maybe we, were, we came from aliens. And I remember saying to him afterwards, how is that any sillier than the beliefs that we hold that um, God was born of a virgin and uh, women were weaker because they got tricked by a snake who talked to them. But it's a funny thing because that's the myths, that's the uh, self-talk that we have as a, as a society. It doesn't strike us as insane when we hear that kind of comment. I've often thought if I told a wrong person today that I had had a conversation with a snake that I might end up awarded the state center. <laughs> I was at the Minneapolis airport about a month and a half ago watching the Falcons team, and all of a sudden this voice behind me says, oh, who's that? Oh, and he's all excited about this, this uh, guy that just had a good running play. And he says, you know why this guy's so good? And I thought he was going to give me some background about this particular player. And he said, the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> He talked about Nimrod, powerful Nimrod, and how he was a leader of men, and he would be enslaved, and then he would be freed, and finally enslaved again. He's talking about the myths that arise from the Bible about the black race. And on and on he went for about 25 minutes. And finally I said to him, I hope you won't be offended if I tell you, I think you're out of your mind. And he was. So. Anyway, on with my point. So, so Eve gets uh, deceived by a snake, so now she's obviously a weaker vessel. And then Paul bolsters that image, if it was in fact Paul who wrote all those letters in the New Testament. But he bolsters this misogynistic attitude about wives being in, wives being in subjection to their husbands. And then my father took that or assumed from that that he had the right to bring his wife back into subjection if she strayed. So, the problem I had with it is when he turned his instructive fist on our mother, it seemed instinctively that something was wrong. When a six foot two, 250 pound man is allowed to beat a woman half his size, there's something wrong with that picture. And I had to ask how the creator of the universe could justify that. But his so-called discipline didn't end with his mother, or his wife, our mother. Um, he was a strong believer in spare the rod and spoil the child. So he had spent uh, the first few years, I remember growing up, he had a barber strap, and that became so crazy that he decided he was going to uh, upgrade. So he got a Maddox candle. For those of you not familiar with a mattock, it's a farm tool. It's like an axe head on one end and a hoe on the other end. And the handle itself is about four and a half feet long. It's got about a 12 to 15 inch circumference at the base. And he would swing that handle like a baseball bat. And he would hit the kid so hard and, you know, half a dozen or a dozen times. And then he would stop and he would yell at him for another 15 minutes to a half hour. Meanwhile, that skin would swell so tight from the damage. When he got back to the physical meeting, it would split, the skin would split, and this kind of bloody, clear fluid would ooze out of the wounds. If he didn't have that mattock available, he would use his fists, he would use his knees, he would use his feet. He used to grab the child, lift him up by their arms, and swing him towards him, and drive his knee into their stomach after he discovered that that had a remarkable capacity to restore order. So these were the kind of things going on when I grew up there. 
So as I grew, my doubts grew with me. As my doubts grew, my defiance grew. And you didn't defy my father. So the level of violence that I experienced here as well. In spite of his uncanny ability to weave arguments and justifications from the words of the Bible, I couldn't reconcile what I heard him say and what I saw him doing to others. How was it possible that the best God had to offer the world was his raging, hateful ideology? Where he saw brute, defiant beasts, I saw humans with good intentions, making their way through the difficulties of life. When he would ridicule and abuse strangers, I would blush with embarrassment and empathy. And my father hated that part of me, so he called it weakness. I, in turn, learned to feel great shame and frustration that my nature didn't match my father's expectations. Because even as I wrestled with the faith of my father, there was a large part of me that accepted his pronouncements of who I was as a person. I want to shift gears here for a minute, folks, and talk to you about this, uh, what I think is an important point. The vast majority of people who have heard my family's message of condemnation and divine hatred respond with some form of, well, that's not my God. My God is a loving God, a caring God, on and on. While each of us is entitled to hold whatever beliefs we wish, there are facts and realities that may conflict with them. And one fact that can't be disputed is that the beliefs held by the Westboro Baptist Church are well grounded in the words of the Bible. This book that is generally interpreted today as the word of a benevolent God contains all the passages necessary to come to the conclusions that my fathers arrived at. It isn't, as most who encounter them would argue, that they've interpreted it wrong. It is that the Bible provides the opportunity for the construction of their theology. In fact, their version of Christianity was the mainstream version 200 years ago in America. Proof of that can be found in a sermon that was re referenced often by preachers of that day. The sermon by American theologian Jonathan Edwards was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the essence of that sermon can be summed up in this sentence from it. There's nothing that keeps wicked men at any one moment out of hell but the mere pleasure of God. So when I hear people say their God is nothing like the God of the Westboro Baptist Church, I'm sorry. I disagree. Does your God condemn the non-believer to an eternity of suffering? Does your God condemn homosexuality? Is the nature of your God exclusive? Did your God have sex with a virgin to give birth to himself? <laughs> if you answer yes to those questions, your God is the God of the Westboro Baptist Church. And if not, you're simply not a Christian. So back to my point. My father taught us that God doesn't change. He's always been as he is. For this reason, he abhorred any evidence of change in the message of the Bible that he saw. As he watched the religions of the world evolve, as it always has, to meet the ideology of modern society, he perceived it as a degradation of the truth. So adhering to the letter of the truth as he saw it was of utmost importance. It became the evidence that they alone were maintaining and defending pure gospel truth. When confronted with the radically changing message of Christianity from antiquity, he was forced to pick a particular time when the real truth was made known to man. And so he picked Calvinism. So for all these reasons I've outlined, and a lot more, I made the decision that I was going to run away from home when I was 16. But I had watched what was going on around me. I saw my older sister try to leave before she turned 18, and she got literally forced back and was uh, viciously beaten for making that mistake. So I realized I had to wait until I was 18. So I applauded, didn't let anybody know, bought a car, packed up my belongings, and then on the night of my 18th birthday, I waited until my whole family was asleep, went and got the car, packed things away, and I went back into the house. I stood in the dining room of the home I grew up in for 18 years. 
And to the left of me was a clock, a clock that was above the, the uh, three refrigerators and two freezers. The stairway was right in front of me that led up to my father's house, and then off to the right was a door that went out into the sanctuary, the, the uh, church door that we lived in. And I could see the pulpit where my father had stood and preached for those 18 years. And I heard his voice booming out to the tiny congregation as he meticulously and exhaustively defined the system of faith that justified his abuse. I recalled him expounding on the verses that proved his enemies were the enemies of God. And I remember him violently re reinforcing his demands that his children contend for the faith with the same intensity that he exhibited, exhibited. I thought it was an incubator of hate. And I turned back to the clock and I watched it slowly rise to midnight and I left. So those who knew the truth, there were a few people that were aware of what was going on around there. Nobody ever did anything about it, but they knew about it. And they were amazed at how normal I was. It's a very subjective term. First, I thought they were exaggerating. I thought I was fine. I, I had gotten out of there and everything was going to be wonderful. What I didn't realize is those few occasions from time to time when I would disappear and would sit with my eyes closed for hours just raging inside was uh, pretty strong evidence that things weren't right. Then in 1981, I moved to Southern California where I met Tammy. We dated for four years and I became a father to her a young child, a young daughter that she had had from a previous marriage. But every time I thought about marriage, I was afraid to broach the subject because I believed that I would condemn both of us to hell because that's what I had uh, been taught growing up. I was also constantly fighting with Tammy because I thought the fact that she wasn't willing to use corporal punishment on her daughter was a real detriment to her because I truly believed that there was a spiritual element to um, physical discipline. So I was with her for about, like I said, four or five years. I managed to kind of put all those concerns to the back and I asked her to marry me. And we got married and then she got pregnant about a month after we got married. I don't know how that happened. But um, what I had never talked to her, one of the things I had never talked to her about was this fear that I had because my father made much of the fact that he had all these children. He, you know, children were a gift from God. So I had uh, unconsciously to some degree made the decision that I was never going to have kids because I had left the church and had angered God and I knew that he would never give me kids. So I became convinced that this was where God was going to knock me down and something was going to happen and that child was never going to be born. So I lived with that silent fear for those seven months and then when he was born, it was the closest thing to a miracle that ever happened in my life. As I sat and stared at this little human, my heart swelled with an emotion that I had never felt before. And 18 months later, we had twins, and things began to unravel soon after. The damage that I thought I had avoided, the obstacles that I naively assumed weren't there, began to surface with a vengeance. My world shifted as I took on this labor of love, raising these three beautiful creatures. I was determined that they would know love and inclusion and that they would never doubt for a moment the unconditional acceptance of their father. And at the same time, I began to ask questions without answers. How could a person feel this way toward another human and ever treat them the way our father treated us? And that old familiar question came back, what was wrong with me? I found a counselor with a theology and psychology degree and we worked together for a year as I began to unravel the hypocrisy of my father's religion. I joined a local evangelical free church to make sure that my kids were a part of the community and felt like they belonged. I listened to the message of the kinder, gentler God of mainstream Christianity, and I began to pray. I prayed night and day for a sign that this God was there and that he cared. His silence took me deeper into the theology. 
I became an outspoken apologist for Christianity by day, but at night I worried and fretted. An interesting little aside to that Christian apologist thing. I actually got published in Playboy magazine. And I remember getting the magazine. There was an article that they wrote about some movie that came out at the time. It wasn't The Passion of Christ, but one of those very controversial and upset a lot of Christians. So clearly I was upset. I don't remember why. But I wrote this scathing editorial to the to the Playboy magazine they published. Then I had a really difficult time convincing my friends in the church that I had to play more magazine for the articles. <laughs> anyway, that's my evidence that I was a, an apologist. Sleepless, anxious hours passed as I played violent confrontations with my father over and over in my mind. It was in these battles that I tested new ideas and beliefs against his rhetoric and doctrine. As I mentioned earlier, each time I would get a hold of an idea that was contrary to what my father taught us, I would find myself struggling with that fear again that somehow I was being tricked by the devil. What it really boiled down to is that I was unable to make the transition from living my father's ideas as a child to embracing my own understanding of the world as I saw it. The system we grew up in did not foster individuality, but rather conformity. The individual was lost to the collective. My depression deepened, I went back into counseling. This time I was diagnosed with PTSD. And I got checked into a mental health facility. Today I understand that enough cognitive dissonance will do that to you. My entire adult life I have continued to subjugate my own thoughts and ideas to those hardwired into my brain. I had failed to look at them for what they were, just ideas. Ideas that were subject to the same rules of proof as any idea. But I hadn't learned that lesson yet, so I left the hospital two weeks later and went back to church and Bible study. Over the next 10 years, a handful of events conspired to force me away from my fear of reason, and I began to challenge my father's ideas more overtly. In the early 90s, as America plunged into the first Gulf War, my personal reaction was colored by a deep fear of this pervasive notion of Armageddon that I had grown up with. As Hussein impotently lobbed scud missiles into Israel, images of nuclear holocaust in the Middle East haunted me. And then at Christmas time in 1994, I stopped at a local pizza hut, had my kids with me, Christmas carols playing, we were waiting for our, our dinner. And my, my oldest boy, Tyler, I think he was seven at the time, he asked me uh, about Jesus. So I had somehow fooled myself into thinking that I could tell this story now and uh, they would accept it and it would be a positive experience for them. So I started talking about the gospel and about heaven and what it was like to be in heaven and that kind of thing. And Tyler interrupted me and said, well, what about the people who don't believe? Bless his atheist little heart. <laughs> So I said, well, the Bible says they go to a place called hell. He said, well, how long do they have to go there? And I said, well, the Bible says it's for eternity. And then he wanted to know how long eternity was. <laughs> and when I said forever, he burst into tears. And I gathered him into my arms, <clears throat> and I recalled an image of me crying in the church pew as I listened to my father so many years before. So I stopped taking my kids to church after that. And I started teaching them to think critically. I challenged them constantly, the ideas they brought home from school, and I taught them to be skeptical, and I taught them to challenge authority. And in the midst of all this, a still small voice kept reminding me, physician, heal thyself. So I began to challenge the ideas of my church they had no answers. When I wrote to National Christian Leaders for Greater Understanding, their rhetoric came back empty too. And then September 11th happened. America was shook to its foundations, and like all of us, I struggled with the powerful emotions that came from that act. I watched as the country responded, and I had an epiphany. We collectively condemn an act of blind faith and then turned to blind faith for answers. 
In 2004, for the first time in my life, I picked up a book that wasn't written by a Christian. Michael Shermer's The Science of Good and Evil changed everything for me. As I poured over his words, hope stirred in my heart. Here was someone who posited a reality I had secretly imagined for years, but dared, dared not give voice to. Here was the justification for so many ideas that I held secretly in my heart. Ideas. We live in a world of ideas. We define our reality with ideas. We give credibility to ideas by calling them facts or capital T truth. But they're just ideas until they're vetted by reality and withstand the test of evidence. With this newfound understanding and confidence, I began to challenge the ideas that were hardwired in my brain. It was okay to ask the questions. What gave my father's Bible validity as the inspired word of a creator? What gave his interpretation of that Bible validity? Where was the evidence? What proof did I have that physical abuse was necessary to raise a child properly? What proof was there that women were inherently inferior? What proof justified that a certain group of people should be shunned and treated unequally because they love someone of the same gender? I spoke earlier of an epiphany I had following September 11th. It occurred to me in the emotional upheaval following that attack that the mechanism of faith, of blind faith, could very well be one of the greatest threats to humans today. A fundamental attribute of faith is that it cannot be challenged. If I invoke faith as justification for a belief, I'm bound to allow that from all others. So by retreating to faith for my beliefs, I now live in a world where I must accept a man's argument that it's okay to fly planes into buildings because he arrived at that argument by faith. The thing that protects the people from dangerous ideas is the ability to challenge the ideas with reason and logic. Faith takes that away. Accountability disappears and literally anything goes. <clears throat> The King James Bible touts faith, hope, and love as desirable attributes. These are what we would call positive, motivating characteristics. Well, I'm not so sure hope is. Hope is, looks to me a little bit more like hand-wringing and hoping everything turns out all right. So that always seems a little weak to me. But faith and love, these are positive motivators. Little Dean Heelman, playing in his backyard, stepped on a sliver of glass, cutting his foot. Love for their son motivated his parents to treat the wound and comfort their child. But the wound continued to bleed, and love once again motivated them to reach out for help. Faith motivated them to reach out to their pastor for that help. Faith motivated them to choose the biblical words of James the prayer, prayer and anointing with oil as the prescribed treatment for their son's injury. Love motivated them to save their son. Faith motivated them to choose an unaccountable method. And little Dean never saw his second birthday because of faith. Faith lets people argue that if you're gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer, you're just evil. Never mind what you do in your life. Never mind if you bring joy and comfort to others. Never mind if you act with kindness and generosity. And never mind whether you chose to be gay. If you're a member of that community, you're prejudged as evil and you can't defend against it. That's what faith does, folks. So I've talked about ideas. Let me challenge you with a new idea, a simple one. Faith is not a virtue. It allows evil to flourish unchecked, and it's the justification for too much hatred. But religion isn't all bad, you might argue. Christians do a lot of good. Besides, my God is a God of love. He doesn't hate. Frankly, I don't care how one defines their personal idea of a God. I care about the doctrines that come straight from religion that harm humans. If you align with a particular God claim, you support their dogma, your ideas of God notwithstanding. 
So back to what I talked about early on. What about this story is sexy? For that, I had to return to the dictionary, researching synonyms for sexy products. For sexy, produce an interesting list. <laughs> There's some obvious ones like hot or foxy. And there were some ones that kind of raised the eyebrow. Doable or hittable. <laughs> then I ran across one near the end of the list that makes no sense to me. Toothsome. <laughs> None of those worked for me, so I went in another direction. How about desirable? Misogynistic treatment of women. Legitimized violence directed at women and children. Absolute authority of men. Hate towards homosexuality, inequality and exclusivity, all paradigms of religion. Is that desirable? Is that sexy? I say nay, nay. <laughs> when I consider these issues, I'll sometimes go into a deep reverie about the myriad of losses associated with not only religious harm, but harm in general. Sometimes I wonder if we really understand the price of harm, the real cost of injustice. Sam Harris talks about choices that increase the overall good. I've imagined a great scale that dips oh so slowly one way or the other based on this concept of overall fairness, justice, goodness, whatever term you want to use. Let's look at the idea of sexual assault, for, an inst for instance. A moment of selfish pleasure translates to a lifetime of negative consequences for the victim. The physical assault is just the beginning of a cascade of events that exponentially increase the overall harm to the violated. Their world forever shifts. Regardless of how successful they might be at overcoming, the fact is they had to overcome. They had to shift their world to find every new moment in the context of that moment. It is in a very real sense a life sentence for them. How many resources that could have been used to advance the individual and society as a whole, or wasted in simply maintaining and carrying on. My little niece was adopted. My, bro my older brother Mark adopted two children. Both of them had extreme fetal alcohol syndrome. And I remember talking to her a few times and she tried to describe what it was like to be her and all of the energy that it took for her to maintain normal, to look normal. How much further she could have been if that burden never existed. Annie's recitation of the religious child struck me powerfully this morning. That's it, folks. That's what I'm talking about. We do great damage to this precious resource. And how much further could we be if these religiously imposed burdens didn't exist? It's these thoughts that come to mind when someone wants to defend religion as at least benign, perhaps even good. Not desirable not sexy. Now equality, a society where there's no longer an issue about who one chooses to love and marry, that is sexy. A world where a person's reproductive organs don't limit them, I would call that voluptuous. A paradigm shift in parenting where we let go of the idea that we have the right to impose our limitations on our children, a new way of thinking, that we have a sacred duty to minimize the harm we saddle these little ones with before they go out into the world. That's desirable. An eight-year-old Yemen girl recently died from the injury she suffered on her wedding night with her 40-year-old husband. A 20-year-old transgender woman was deliberately targeted and beat to death by a group of young men in New York recently. There are still 35 states in this country that still deliberately demonstrate discriminated based on religious ideas. Religion sets the stage. We must do better. Several weeks ago, CFI's Geneva-based Geneva -based UN representative, Dr. Elizabeth O'Casey, addressed the UN Council on Human Rights, saying, quote, culture and religion must never legitimize anachronistic practices that violate the core principles of equality, autonomy, and dignity, dignity upon which human rights are based. Now that's hot. Let me close with this final thought. The British philosopher Bertrand Russell was interviewed late in his life and he was asked, 
What would you like to pass on that you've learned in life? What do you think it would be worth telling future generations? He said, I should like to say two things, one intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say is this, when you're studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you wish to believe or what you think would have beneficial social effect if it were believed. But look only and solely at what are the facts. That's the intellectual thing I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say, I should say love is wise and hatred is foolish. Now that, folks, is too soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, you get time for uh, maybe two. Two? Greta? Um, so I realized that asking what is the reason behind a belief system that's as irrational as my way of putting it, as you call it, is absurd. But I feel like you need to ask this anyway. Given that your father believes that everything is predestined and that people are predestined, chosen ahead of time to go to heaven or go to hell. What is the point of what is the point of going to funerals and holding up signs that says God defense? Who is he trying to persuade that this is all predestined? What's the point? Well, he, he would argue that it's because I, I talked a little bit about the fact that you really don't know what it's gonna to take to make God happy because it, it's so arbitrary. We like to feel like that if we're going to get the praise, it's because we're going to do a thing. And that's kind of how the world works. But here you've got a doctrine that says that you don't do anything. In fact, you could be a, you know, a serial killer or someone really evil in, in uh, society's mind, and you could be one of those saved. So it's very arbitrary. So you look for very specific details in the Bible that tells you what you're supposed to do. And then the fact that you are going through that process that you are then engaging in the, the steps that you perceive you're supposed to be taking, that's evidence that God's working in your heart, okay? So, the Bible says, by the foolishness of preaching, we will save others, right? Several other passages that talks about preaching. It's your job to preach, and he's gonna preach, and none of the rest of it has to make any sense. So. Best way I can answer that. Over here. Are any of your other siblings out, and what's your relationship with the rest of your family? Yeah, um, my older brother left before I did. That was one of the things that convinced me I could leave. And he and I have a good relationship. We worked for like 25 years together in Southern California. And then I have a younger daughter uh, who left. She stayed in Topeka, changed her last name. Um, and we, we have a good relationship. We don't talk that often, but, but we have a good relationship. So. And the rest of them, they're not allowed to talk, so I don't have a relationship with them. Okay. Um, I hear a lot from people who claim that, oh, they're just trolling, they're just looking to get money, they're just looking for a song. They don't actually believe that stuff, so why are we giving them attention and, and bringing attention to them? Because that just helps them. Um, and I was wondering what your views are on that idea of like just ignoring them and hopefully they'll go away and they're not, they don't actually believe they're just trolling. Yeah. So there was a couple of different questions there. Um, first of all, I have no doubt in my mind that my father believes what he's preaching. Um, I don't know about my siblings. I know that when I was there, it was very difficult not to believe it. And it, not being there, it's still difficult to let go of some of it. So I have to believe that at some level they all believe it. Uh, as to the question of uh, why don't we just ignore them, uh, I think it's a good idea. I don't think it'll happen. And I know that it won't make them go away. So, short and succinct. Anyway, thank you all very much.